you don't you don't really know him. Hey, this is Troy Taylor with the Coach McNally Offensive Line Podcast. Sponsored by Rat Coach, Tip of the Spear, the Top Hopper. Use the code Top Hop to save 5% on your next order. Sports Workbook. Now, Coach McNally, I got my resume. Okay. Well, actually, it's another guy's resume, and he sent it to me. And he wants a job. And his resume is this In 2008, he was a freshman coach. In 2010 through 2018, he coached varsity. It doesn't say what team or what their record was. And then from 2019 to current, five years, now beginning year 11 at the high school level and 16 years overall. All right, so I guess I don't know if he coached in the NFL for five years or he coached rec ball, but he is anti-weight belts. Coach Hans and Franz on Saturday Night Live wore weight belts. You wear a weight belt. Why does this guy not like weight belts, and why does he not like you dry humping a chair in your bathroom? Well, uh, first of all, I don't have anybody else to block, so when I'm demonstrating, I have to go in my bedroom, my bathroom. I have to block a chair. I have, if I want to demonstrate. Uh, yeah, uh, you, you, you know, I mean, you got to hit, you got to block something if you're demonstrating in your own home. Uh, I'll tell you why I wear a weight belt. I put on a little weight because of this one pill I'm taking. And you ever see these dogs and animals and they feel more comfortable or they have less anxiety when they put a belt around them or like a, like a, like a little coat around them. And that, that belt that I wear, mm-hmm. even though it is a weight belt, that yeah. belt tucks me in. You know what I mean? That's it a Carabello. Kind of, That's a high dollar weight belt. Yeah. It kind of makes me feel like I'm secure. You know <laughs> what I mean? It's like, I don't like the feeling of the, my gut just kind of hanging over. And then the pants, my shorts kind of loose. Yeah. I like the feeling of a belt that ties you in and i just happened to fall in i i always had this weight belt i just happened to be wearing it one day because my back was bad and i liked it so i fucking wear it all the time yeah we're gonna get a sponsorship from a weight belt company out there jim tim supposedly is a rep for rogue fitness and he's supposed to send us a weight belt but wyatt bode coach our friend wyatt bode from minnesota eh that's where they talk like Canadians, eh? What is this McNally dunk technique? And how do you not get the toilet paper to fall apart? He can't figure it out. He's been researching it, Coach. He's been going back well, in the archives. The, the, the dunk technique was when I was a kid, maybe in high school, and you you take a poop, whatever, and, uh, you know, your asshole is kind of like, uh, well, uh, let me put it this way. Your, your, uh, your asshole is kind of like that. Okay. It's yeah. kind of got those little wrinkles in them. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? So you can always keep wiping and you can always keep getting one more brown spot. I, I yeah. figured that out. So when I would take the, uh, Paper. flush the toilet, take yeah. a poop, flush the toilet, the toilet was, water was pretty clean. I thought. Anyway, I would take the toilet paper, dunk it down, then give the ass, old asshole an extra wipe, and I could get right between those creases. And that was the McNally dunk technique. Wow. And you have taught all of your players in the last 50 years the McNally dunk technique. I've taught everybody the dunk technique. I said, well, don't be well. The, the water might be distant. Fuck the water. It's fine. You could drink out of the fucking toilet. <laughs> dogs do all the time but yes they do they don't get sick right as long as you flush the shit down you're fine you're fine coach so here we go the o-line guru coach mcnally would you like to send out a public service announcement to everybody all your eight thousand followers coach about video 
Well, video, I, I will send video, usually a two-minute clip uh, uh, regarding a technique, if I have it. And, I, and I'll write a blog or, you know, I'll write something about it. But I do not want to evaluate people's video because I'd be doing it all day long. I try to accept as many people as I can within reason, okay? And I got 20 kids a day, coach, would you look at my video? Would you just look at three or four? And I say, no, that's not my job. My job is not to evaluate your film. I got coaches saying, coach, would you look at a couple of plays of my duo or my power? I'm like, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. Because then the next coach is going to ask me. The next coach is going to ask me. Now, if I'm on another site like CoachTube where I sell videos or whatever, that's a different story. Or I'm speaking at a clinic where I get paid, fine. But I am not going to evaluate anybody's fucking video, whether it's a player or a coach. So I don't know if that's what you meant. Yeah, coach. Do you want to talk to your followers about all the bruises you have all over your body? Well, I have all these bruises all over my body because I'm a martial arts semi-expert. And when I'm dealing with players, we're constantly grappling, trapping, uh, you know, using the hands for different types of swipes. And because I'm old, and I, I'm not on any blood thinners that I get constant. My whole body is black and blue, really. Uh, so that's why I am. Uh, that's and why the I'm guy you were going there. against, he was not small. Six foot eight, 330 pounds. Yeah, I, and I had him on the ground in 30 seconds. Ken Oxendine, coach. He's from Chester, Virginia. He's where, He's from where I'm from. He went to Thomas Dale High School. I coached at L.C. Bird. I did, I, did, I did FBU with him. Ken Oxendine says, love Coach McNally. Sat in with him one summer and learned some great info. One of the greatest. That guy yeah, right he here. Was, he was a coach. He played in the NFL, and he was also uh, 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 a coach at and at, uh, uh, football university, which I used to do some camps. And he was a very nice guy. I mean, kind of an unusual pro football player. Oh, coach. Most yeah. of them are semi assholes. Not all of them. <laughs> some great ones. But this guy's a good guy. Oh, he is, coach. He, everybody loves the ox. I mean, that is a big tailback. I mean, any kid that thinks they are tailback, look at ox. All right. He played at Virginia Tech, then he played for the Falcons. Will King, as a Marshall Hall of Famer and former Marshall University All-American. I love the Marshall shirt. Go yeah, well, thundering I, her. I, 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 in fact, I like this kind of discourse better than I like the football discourse because with the football discourse, which I love, 90% of the people don't understand what I'm talking about playing long or lifting or uh, rooting the feet. And it's like I got to tear my hair out just to get guys to understand. So when they're asking general questions, it's easier to please the crowd than try to explain to them, no, no, that's not what I'm talking about when you use your hands or you use your flippers or you use your blah, blah, blah. Marshall, okay. I'm at the University of Buffalo for 10 years. I'm Man. a player, actually, and a coach. My coach was Buddy Ryan. That's why my nose, I think I've showed you this before. I wasn't, I'm not a big Go guy. Go sideways, my, coach. Yeah, yeah. I my nose wasn't always like like turn this way. Yeah, okay. Look my sideways. nose wasn't always like that. Turn like sideways these, more. There you go. Yeah, okay. But <laughs> yeah. what I'm saying is all these drills, I mean, I gotta have CTE, blah, blah, blah. But but anyway, uh Buffalo, the team where I went, we dropped football in 1970. And uh, November 14th, 1970, Marshall had the plane crash. And then I was on the coaching staff that followed 
the 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 coaching staff and the players that were that were killed in the plane. So I have a warm spot in my heart for Marshall. I was there four years, uh, and uh, I was a member of the Young Thundering Herd. That was the Thundering Herd is the Marshall's nickname, but we were the Young Thundering Herd because we were we only had freshmen that were eligible. Uh, and the new group of freshmen that were coming in. So I was there in the toughest time of the rebuilding process. So I love my shirt too. And the quarterback for that team after the plane crash, he was actually one of the players that did not go on the trip to East Carolina. And he came. His name was Reggie Oliver. Yes. And, and he was y'all's know. quarterback. And who did y'all play in the first game? And tell us about how Marshall won the first game after the plane crash well, we on the last the, play we, of the game. We, we, we didn't win the first game. We played Moorhead State in Kentucky. We lost. But the second game, we played Xavier, which was a basketball school in Cincinnati. But they used to play football. They weren't bad, really. And – uh so we played Xavier, and uh, we beat them uh, on the last play of the game. It was 213 bootleg screen, actually, that Red Dawson called. And we threw it to Terry Gardner. And, uh, you know, we faked a dive like on the veer, and then the quarterback rolled out, and we pulled a guard. And we threw it back to uh, a guy named Terry Gardner from Portsmouth, Ohio, and he scored a touchdown, and uh, we won the After game. the gun. After the gun had sounded. Oh, it, it, it was either right at the gun or with a second to go. Or, I mean, I can't remember exact timing, but it was the last, it was the last play. What an amazing story. Is that even in the movie, Coach? It is in the movie, but they make it look like a long bomb that was the winning play. You know, like a Hollywood type part of the movie. Like, yeah. They made they made the touchdown play look like it was a long pass and the ball stayed in the air, stayed in the air, stayed in the air, you know, on the movie, and the guy caught it. Well, that yeah. wasn't the play. The play was 213 bootleg screen. Man, coach, you got the play call down. And Jim Jack, Kim. We pulled Jack Crabtree, who's a Virginia boy, and he was a hell of a player for us. Uh, in fact, I think he was in sporting goods, he still is maybe in uh, the Virginia area. Uh, yeah, I know that name. Yeah, Crabtree. Yeah, he was an excellent player. Okay, so, so I'm going to go in with Will King here. says, yes, sir, Reggie Oliver, a great man. I played for Jim Donnan, and Mickey Matthews was our DC. Yes, that, that was after us, you know, probably – Oh my God! Probably at least ten years, uh, and, and and you know, there was a guy. I think when they started winning, it was the coach that went to Kansas State. I forget his name. And then Donnan came in and was starting to win. And then uh, George Chomp was a big, big winner actually. And then uh, uh, Bob Pruitt. Uh, so that, high school coach from Virginia. What's that? Bob Pruitt was a high school coach from Virginia. And he went to Marshall. He was a, he was a football player at Marshall and like a, a homegrown boy. And, uh, uh, yeah. Will and King played 1990 to 1993. Jim Tim from Rochester, New York. He coach, he sent his resume to the head coach at Southern Utah and said he will work for free. But one thing I found out about Jim Tim this week, coach, is he is a big fan of Low Low Jones. Do you remember Low Low Jones that was in the Olympics? No, I don't remember Low Low. You don't okay. He's a he's a he he sent he sent his resume to Southern Utah and he said he'll work for free, but he wants to know, coach, when you coach with the Giants, did you know Joe Hegner, traveling coordinator? Joe Hegner. That name is not familiar to me. I was there with the Giants 
from 1999 to 2003. Now, Coach maybe- Bald. And I asked Coach Bald what you wanted to know, Coach, and he is not completely bald. Okay? It I will is- tell you th- something about volunteering. Go ahead. Tell him. That Paul Brown taught me. Because I worked for the Bengals my first time for 15 years. And I actually worked for the legend. Paul Brown was the owner for a good 10 years. He invented three quarters of football. Yeah. He says we never take volunteers. Because even though they'll work for free, you always feel sorry for them. And in their own little way, they always have their hand out. Hmm. Example. A volunteer comes for free, doesn't have a place to stay. So he asks somebody, can I stay with you? A volunteer really doesn't have a whole hell of a lot of money. I'm not talking about Coach Tim, maybe, but I'm talking about in general. So really, the volunteer becomes a pain in the ass because you're always kind of feeling sorry for him. And you'd rather hire somebody full time, give them a retirement plan, you know. And, and you can fire them. You can't fire somebody that's a volunteer. At least you can fire somebody. So, so Paul Brown would never take a volunteer. Well, Paul Brown, Coach Paul Brown, got fired by the team that was named after him. And the reason, and what happened was. When Paul Brown got fired, he retired for a couple of years. And the reason he hired Forrest Gregg to coach the Bengals after they fired Homer Rice was Forrest Gregg also got fired by Art Modell. Mm -hmm. So he contacted Forrest Gregg, who won the Grey Cup in Toronto as a head coach of the Toronto Argonauts. Horace Gregg was the greatest player to ever play for Vince Lombardi. And Paul Brown told Forrest Gregg that you and I are going to get together. I'm the owner. You'll be the coach. And we're going to kick the shit out of the Cleveland Browns and Art Modell. And we Mm. did for a good number of years. Coach Coach Bald says, is it true that he has had sparring sessions with Chuck Norris and actually taught him foot fire. Have you ever sparred with Chuck Norris coach? And did you teach him the foot fire? Have you ever met Chuck Norris? No, but I know who Chuck Norris is. He had some great movies and he was Texas Walker. What is it? Walker Ranger. No, but I knew, I knew, uh, Johnny Bench and Pete Rose pretty well. Oh, you did? did. Tell me about Johnny Bench, because I'm a Johnny Bench fan. He's my favorite player. And Pete Rose, he was hard. Charlie Hustle. Tell me about those guys, Coach. Yeah, they used to come and and they used to come uh, when their season was over, or maybe even during their season, and they used to come to our Bengals office, because our our offices where we practiced was right near the, the uh, riverfront stadium and they would come in and, and they'd watch us practice and this, that, and the other. And, uh, uh, Pete Rose was, I mean, he would have been a great, you know, defensive back running back. Uh, he wasn't quite big enough to be a linebacker, but you talk about balls to the wall full speed. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Johnny Bench had big hands. He was a catcher, He's, of course. Johnny Bench is not and, small. Uh, Johnny Bench yeah. is 6'4", isn't he? What's, no, no. He wasn't 6'4". He was probably 6'2", but uh, but he, he was a great player. I mean, he had a great arm. He could throw people out at second base. He was a good hitter. And, uh, uh, you know, I mean, it was the big red machine. So I, when I, or my early years with the Bengals, we had those great teams with Dave Concepcion and uh, Joe Morgan, Joe Morgan, Johnny Bench, Pete Rose. Yes, sir. There is. I'm going to show you something. 
Look at this. You probably can't read that. Joe see, Morgan. It's, an o- it's an Oakland A's baseball coach. They have the hundred mile yard sale here and starts in Amelia, Virginia, goes all the way to like South Hill. And I found this for five dollars, two of them. I got two of them for 10 bucks last year. I didn't even know Joe Morgan played for the Oakland A's. But well, I kind of that? forgot. Yeah, I kind of forgot that he did. He did leave the Reds and, uh, and and went elsewhere. That was a heck of a deal. All right, Will King says, yeah, George Chomp, Jim Donnan, and Bob Pruitt. And, man, they had some great And, and, and there was man. a guy before George Chomp that was the guy that actually started winning. He was the he, he had to be the head coach at Kansas State. And he's the one that really started to win. So he was the head coach at Kansas State before Snyder? I don't know, but Google Google the coaches at Kansas State within the last 20 years, and he was the first coach at Marshall that started to win, even before Chomp. So I, I forget his name. I think he coached at like Rutgers or uh, anyway. I'm looking right here, Kansas State. Yeah. Coach, while I look this up, who is the GOAT, the greatest of all time, the biggest name dropper of you. all time? You. Now, I I had someone tell me that Jim McNally – was the biggest name dropper of all time. So I'm even a bigger name dropper than you. Stan Parrish. Stan Parrish. Stan Parrish won games at Marshall. I don't know how many, but that's when they first started to win. Coach, our friend Steve Saunier had it up here. He he typed it in there, Coach. Our great friend from West Florida, Matt Davis, Coach. Good evening. Awesome podcast. Love, listen. Coach McNally gives so much information and what amazing stories he tells. I love that he is no nonsense. No BS guy. Basically tells you how it is. Now, Coach. Yeah. We got into a discussion the other day on the phone, and I was asking you about the great Frank Glacier and the Glacier Clinics. Yes. Would Frank Glacier, would he have liked me, Coach? Was he a football guy? Tell me about Frank Glacier. He would have liked you. Frank Glazer started Glazer Clinics, and uh, he started them by himself. It was a one-man show. He might have had a couple helpers and this, that, and the other. And he used to pay in cash. Okay, McNally, here, (laughs) you got a couple hundred bucks for uh, that speed. Here's a couple more. Yeah, yeah, here, take this for your wife. Take this, uh, you know. He wrote every invite by himself that went out in the mail. And here's what he did. If you got, he blew a whistle. It's time for the clinic to start. If you got up there and started to bullshit, like all those head coaches yes. would do, you know, like a yeah, in culture. The old days you listen, used to listen to head coaches at clinics. They never told you shit. But if, <laughs> if you were an assistant coach, and you got up and started to give a history of this and that, and or you put the you know the big uh, uh, what do you call it when you put a uh, you know you do a pie a real, chart a what a pie chart uh, no when everybody does a real beautiful uh, a PowerPoint PowerPoint he blows whistle <laughs> hey enough of that bullshit get right to the football. He stopped Man. a clinic with 300 people in an audience, told them all to get out. He chewed the guy's ass. And the guy was from Penn State. I forget his name. And he told that motherfucker, he said, if you don't start talking football, I said, you are not going to be giving this session. Then he brought everybody back in, and then the guy started talking football. And but there was none of that bullshit. That's what I hate about clinics. You get in the clinic, they put these beautiful PowerPoints in, and they got like 30 fucking points, this, that, the other. Just 
who gives a fuck about that? You want to see the movement, the action, the play, the block, the uh, the route. The, the you know, yeah. you want to get right to the football. All that other PowerPoint bullshit is total fucking bullshit. Yeah, it's just Tom Taker. I would Taker never of- do it. I would never even do it if I was twenty five years old given a clinic. I'm yeah. going to get right to the fucking put football, period. And he would not allow people to stand in the lobby and talk. Everybody had to get out of the lobby and go in and listen. He wouldn't let people sit out and BS and yuck it up, would he? I don't know that because I was always in the clinic or <laughs> speaking, so I, I never stood outside. I mean, you had like 10 minutes uh, to uh, – you know, go to the uh, exhibit bathroom. Yeah, see the see the vendors. Yeah, the, the vendors. Yes. And Charlie Co- Coinier told me that he was basically like the the page. He went and picked up people at the airport. Charlie did, and he was telling me about a story that uh, you claimed that this is not true, but I was told that you and Frank Glacier were in the lobby, in your underwear, um, I think blocking each other, but you claim that that is not true. Why is that? I, know, well, I don't wear underwear. So if I was in there, I would be, I would have been free balling it. And so, yeah. no, I never wore any underwear. It was too fucking tight. So you Frank know. Glacier might have. He Frank, might have been. Frank, Frank might have had, yeah. <laughs> so his his clinic was more than just a clinic. Y'all had a good time. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And he paid the shit out of the clinicians. If he if if he liked you, but he didn't have that many of them, and he had cash, and he would slip, oh, here's a couple hundred for oh yeah, how many hours you speak? Oh okay, take your wife out to dinner. Blah, 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 blah. It was all cash. And I don't know. Strollo knew Coach Glazier, correct? He did. They were from the same high school, and I think maybe Glazier was the coach before before Strollo was a player, but they are both from Long Branch High School in New Jersey. Long Branch High School. Some guys were texting me about our podcast, Coach, um, and they said that there's nothing like it and that it is elite. They said that there's nobody else doing a podcast like us and having as many speakers and as many NFL guys. And it's been you and it's been Steve getting these guys to come in here and talk about football. What do you think about drills, Coach? I heard that you are a drill guy. You like (laughs) drills. You got all kinds of drills. Listen, I'm almost a 60-year-old coach. I'm almost 80, but I'm almost 60 years as a coach. Fuck the drills. The drill is the technique. Okay. Now I had drills before I really knew how to do a drill. Okay. So a drill to me. Okay. Here's a center. Okay. I'll draw the center. Okay. He's here right there. Okay. And let's say he's got to block this guy. Okay. All right. Where is he right there? Center's got to block that guy, whether he's going front side, back side, by there. So you put a center there with a ball. You take the snap as the coach, and you tell him the technique you want to use to block that guy. And now, of course, you've told him how to step and how to use your hands or whatever, and that's the fucking drill. I'll tell you what coaches are. They're fucking lazy. Here's why. They love drills. You know why they love drills? Because they're time taker uppers, you know, because the head coach might say, hey, I'll give you an hour worth of drills. Well, the fucking line coach, he doesn't know what to do. So he wants six different drills to take up that hour. And he's really not doing shit. Okay, so a drill is the technique as if you're in the game. It might be two on two. And then as you see the two on two work. Oh, no, you know, take a little bigger split. Oh, no, step with your inside foot a little better. Oh, defensive guy, you better charge harder. 
That's the way you coach drills, not with all these boards, bags, shoots, and that bullshit. That is all fucking bullshit. And it's not because I'm old. It's be, You don't need nothing to coach a fucking drill. Coach, you're from New York, and so was Vince Lombardi. Did and you ever get a fucking liberal fucking town or a liberal state? I hate fucking liberals. So if we have anybody listening to us, they'll hang up. But we are a fucking liberal state. My taxes where I live are 17 grand. We're paying for all the bullshit in New York City. There goes my political statement for the evening. Well, coach, I everybody I know that is a football fan is conservative. All right, they it's a conservative game. And there's people in this country that would have us arrested for playing football. They say that it is violent, coach, and it is not safe. All right, now, did you ever get a chance to meet Coach Lombardi, coach? Uh, I think I might have met Coach Lombardi when he spoke at the National Football Clinic maybe 30. 40 years ago, and he was like the main speaker at a dinner or something, I may have gone up and shaken his hand. But I did work for Forrest Gregg, and in Forrest Gregg's office, there was a plaque, and the plaque read, Forrest Gregg is the greatest football player I've ever coached, quotes, quoted by Vince Lombardi. Now, Vince Lombardi back in the day had great players, Bart Starr, Paul Harning, Willie Fleming, uh, Max McGee. Uh, you know, they may not have had the great athletes like we have nowadays, but here's a tackle or guard that he indicated was the greatest player he ever coached. Hmm. I hate the NFL here, Coach, is watching on YouTube. He says he lives in California, and I feel, Coach. I've never been to California. Um, I don't even know where it is on a map. It's all the way out in west. All right, I'm not going to go all the way out there. Uh, Wyatt Bode from Minnesota. John Gallardi from St. John's just ran plays. John Gallardi also... Never wore pads in practice. Do you remember John Gallardi, the Division Three coach from up there in the north? Probably Minnesota. I, I, I believe I've heard of his name, but I, I never kept track of him and followed him. Yeah, so I, he was kind of he was kind of new school, even though he was old. Playing long. What does that mean to you, coach? When you say playing playing long means I'm not using a flipper, a shoulder, okay, uh, a rip. I'm playing with extension, extension. Whether it's two hands, one hand. Why? Because the more extension I have, okay, as I strike something the more space I have to see what I want to do. Do I have to come off on a linebacker? Do I have to throw this guy? Can I lift this guy? Uh, Do I get the first touch? Because when I play long, I probably touch the defensive guy before he touches me because I know the snap count. Absolutely. Playing long is not rocket science. (laughs) <laughs> okay, that's why guys have long arms. You yeah, that's why I mean? we yeah. they all measure their arms. They want to know how long their arms are. Yeah, and it, it wouldn't matter if it was junior high, little league, whatever. The guy that gets the first touch or the first whatever, whether it's with one hand, now one arm is longer than two. I know that much. Here's two hands. Okay, if I can get get us here, here's two hands. Okay, going out, and then here's one hand going out. One arm is longer than two. So anyway, that when you extend your hands, okay, or your arms, or whatever the hell you want to call these appendages, that's playing long. And there's no question, no question, 
It's better than the shoulders, the forearms that I was brought up with because you get mired into the block and the defensive guy can throw you. When you play long, you generally can get the first touch and you can negate the defensive guy from grabbing you, holding you, whatever all of those things defensive guys do. Yeah, and we sat and we watched film before this and all these defensive linemen playing in the gray area, two gapping and just grabbing offensive linemen. And they say, get the head out of the game. Everybody wants the head out of the game. Playing long helps that, doesn't it, Coach? Oh, and absolutely. nobody is more old school than you. No one played for Buddy Ryan that's still around when you no, didn't no wear one. face no, masks. No, other than some college player, uh, other than some pro players, I played for Buddy Ryan, okay? But he was a defensive coach. But that's got nothing to do with playing long. Uh, but they didn't, uh, they didn't teach playing he, long. He was our defensive coach, but but playing long, you were brought up the way everybody else was brought up, the way they were coached in the old days. That's all they knew how to do was hit the crowder, the forearm, blah blah blah, whatever. Uh, you can still hit a crowder slide with your hands. You can grab those pads, whatever, but. Uh, the man that plays long wins. First touch wins. That's just like a big guy that that's a friend of yours and he just sticks his hand out and 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 you try to run into him and you can't run into him because his this length is keeping you from getting into his chest. The thing that bothers me is when I start talking about playing long there's a lot of people that even though we explain it, can't understand it. They just can't understand it. Uh, they were brought up with the flippers, the shoulders, which I was too, but I learned and I researched and I saw how to play. You know, like guys will go in on a double team and they'll hit with the floor. Well, you go on a double team if you're the drive guy, like post and drive, you're the drive guy and, and, and you're, you're, you're kissing off a guy, uh, whatever. When you shove the guy, you, you, you get on him longer. When you get into him with a shoulder, you mire your body in. You can't get off fast enough to the linebacker. Blah, blah, blah. I mean, there's a there's 50 or 60 techniques in football where you can say you should play long. And that that's what you are, that's what you're preaching now. Absolutely. Play long. Absolutely. Roll the hips. Roll the hips. If anybody goes to the zoo, and it's a zoo that's got a lot of animals. And if you watch the gorillas in the zoo, they scamper around with their asses down and their heads are up. And it's like, uh, if you see the gorilla in the zoo, he looks like this as he's scampering around, okay? Uh, and I'll try to show you a diagram if I can get here close enough, the bottom diagram. Yeah. It's like you're squatting. It's like you're hand cleaning. Yeah, but he's not falling on his face. He's no. moving. He's scampering around. And he's low. Uh, and, and, and he's, I mean, he's, you know how fast they can move. And, but his ass is down and his head is up. Yes, we don't want the head down. No, we don't want a it, flat back. It's almost like the best stances are those old stances. If you ever saw that old Notre Dame film or uh, any books by Newt Rockney and you look at their offensive line, their asses were almost on the ground. That bullshit of ass up like this, okay, flat back is bullshit. Why? Flat back, you fire out, all the defensive guys got to move and you fall right on your face. Period. Yeah. That, that, that was antiquated bullshit. That's the way I was coached. It was so bullshit. It, it, it was like, shit, I, I, I don't know how we ever survived. 
you know, we were so out of control. There was no gatherability, no arching of the back, no sitting your butt down, no anchor. You know, your the anchors you have in your body are your feet and your hands. Your hands is an anchor. An anchor is something that that is strong. You drop the anchor into the ocean. It's strong. It grabs the turf underneath. Your hands are anchors. Your feet are anchors. You've got to anchor your feet. you got to anchor your hands. So you, you do not. I'm about to laugh because I know you're going to get mad. You do not teach the lead step. Oh, fuck no. I, 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 even when I taught the lead step, the guys weren't doing it. And I don't know where that lead step bullshit came from because it was bullshit because you have to lower your center of gravity. When you take a, what are you, a brace step or whatever you call, I, we don't use a drop step, but when you, when you drop that foot, you lunge forward, you go, you open your hips to, to let your body move forward. When you step forward, you lock your hips. It's like the old posting on Pass Pro. You lock your inside hip. You can't stay with a guy that pinches inside. Yeah, and don't you, get me started there. That that lead step shit is fucking antiquated. Okay? It, it may work in junior high school and high school, but you get with the big boys, you know, the colleges and uh, anybody that knows how to strike you, you'll have a foot off the ground as the defensive guy is striking you. When you lower your center of gravity and drop that foot as you're lunging forward, you will have leverage. Leverage. Yes. So you do not believe anymore in the post foot? I do not. And I basically invented it. I didn't really invent it. A guy named Jerry Wampfler invented it in 1977 or 8. And he taught it to me. He was a coach of the Eagles. And then I ran with it, and I told the whole world about the post foot. And then I kept looking and looking, and I said, what the fuck? The guy's going inside. I'm pounding the post. My hips are locked. They knocked my hand down. I can't block the guy. So I learned that when the guy goes inside, you drop your post foot. And you don't use your inside hand. Don't use your inside hand. They knock it down. Just use your outside hand. Leave your inside hand low that can clamp a guy or, you know, clamp his hip when he goes inside. But you leave, you you power step that inside foot and you leave that inside hand up. Okay. Let's say I'm going to my left. Okay. And this is my left hand. Okay, and I'm going to my left. Well, this looks like I'm going to my right. But but anyway, they knock that hand down and your post foot is locked. If you just did a normal wave drill and you told the guy to go outside, go outside, now go inside, they'll naturally drop their post foot when they go inside. Because when they change direction, they can open their hips by dropping the foot in the direction they're going. On the Twitter. Post foot is bull, the power post step foot is, is done. Bull, is bullshit. The post foot is done. Just like the well, lead step, well, just well, like well, playing well, short. If, if, if the defensive guy knows how to attack people that are using the post foot, it's done. If they don't know what they're doing, they just run into the guy. But if they know how to knock the guy's inside hand down and beat him inside, the post foot is. Now, if you got center help, different story. It don't matter. You got a you got a body there. But if you're all alone on the man side, and the guy goes inside, and you kind of keep trying to post foot, you'll never block a good pinch. You may end he's up. He's going to get hit to him. Okay, but he'll get penetration. Steve says, Bad Rad didn't teach the post step either, if I am correct. Bad Rad. Who is Bad Rad, Coach? Uh, Bad Rad is a guy named Dan Radakovich. And uh, all he taught was kind of shuffling the feet, kind of uh, mirror Good down. fire. Yeah, just, 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 you know, the feet were, were always moving. And Bad Rad was the first, time, first guy 
to use the use of the hands. Okay. And he probably started that with the Steelers in uh, the mid to late seventies. And, but he punched with two hands. Okay. Yeah. I don't like that anymore. I like they do. I will use two hands, but only on certain types of, of, of pass blocks. But what I'm saying is bad rad was, the first guy to use his hands on pass blocking rather what than what did they do like before? Him. Did they do this on pass blocking? They did. Hey. But then they allowed the hands, and Bad Rad was the first guy that either uh, spoke up on using the hands or that the uh, the the rules committee allowed them to use the hands but he's really the first guy that used the hands so paul alexander when he had the vhs tape what michigan was he at central michigan western michigan using the hands i remember that guy had that an old offensive line coach had a vhs tape of paul alexander was he at central michigan or western michigan he was at central michigan uh when they beat Michigan State in, oh, I don't know, it was probably the late 70s, uh, early 80s. Uh, yeah, he was. Uh, he went to Cortland State, New York, and he GA'd both at Penn State and Michigan. And then his first job was the line coach at Central Michigan under Herb Dermonide. Herb Dermonide. Do you yeah. think that Paul Alexander would be impressed that I know that he had the VHS tape talking about playing with the hands when he was at Central Michigan? I think he would be impressed for about 10 seconds. And then he would be off in Europe somewhere seeing some place that I don't even know exists in a country that I don't even know exists. They're probably communists over there now, coach. I don't even know, you know, but we're still democratic. I guess we're a democracy. They say um, here in the United States of America, you want to get on that coach? Are you a Patriot? Are you, are you I'm a, a patriot. Proud American? I'm a Patriot. We have a Navy seal that played for us this year in his fifth year. He played, uh, he was a walk-on at Nebraska. He never played high school football. His name is Damian Jackson. In fact, there was a gentleman who saw me on Twitter named John Perez, who's an agent out of New Jersey. And I, I, I kept asking everybody, does anybody, do anybody know any agents, any agents? We've got this Navy SEAL. He's 30 years old. And a lot of these NFL teams, he thinks he's too old. He was a walk-on at Nebraska, never played football in high school. And he went to Nebraska after six years in the Navy SEALs as a sharpshooter. Boom. Yeah. Okay. And as a demolition expert, he's a trained killer. Okay. So he never knew how to play football. He spent four years at Nebraska and started to play. And they taught him how to long snap. He spent his fifth year at Buffalo this year, and he started at outside backer. He's about 6'2", 255, strong as an ox. Strongest man they've ever had in the Nebraska program, they'll tell you. And uh, and he, he's a good long snapper, but he was not the starting long snapper because when he went to Nebraska, they had one. And when he came here to Buffalo in the portal, they had one. Uh, so he had a pro day. His snaps were good. He did pretty good in all his workouts, broad jump. And this one gentleman, John Perez, who is a lawyer and also a sports agent, said, I will represent him. He says, the chances are teams will say he's too old. But again, a 30-year-old thir Navy SEAL is in better shape than an 18-year-old human being. Okay, I never met a Navy SEAL. When I met this kid, I was in awe. I followed him around like he was the Pied Piper. Did you so actually I, go to Buffalo? I'm a true American. Yes. A true American. Absolutely. Uh, a real American. Like Hulk Hogan was a real American. 
Stephen Gukian. Like those country western singers, not like those fucking Hollywood fuckers. I fucking hate. I don't hate people that are liberal, liberal in certain ways, but I hate flaming liberals. Yeah, flaming fucking liberals. All this L B J L. Well, would yeah, would I, what's uh, would uh, coach? What's his name? Would the lead singer of the Eagles? Would he be considered a liberal? He is a no, hippie, right, coach? No, he would not be considered an eagle, a, a liberal. No. Okay, we got her, Steve Gukian said Herb Dermody was a legendary coach at Central Michigan. And then we got a comment here. I'm not going to show the comment, coach, but there's, there's a guy that he's got a beard and long hair. He says that Anthony Munoz is not the GOAT. Anthony Munoz is not the GOAT because he – wasn't a finisher. That coach, he's full of shit. Anthony Munoz, you Google anything, they'll say he's the number one offensive lineman in the history of football. He's, he's full of shit. He's not the GOAT. He's not the GOAT. Years. He's not yeah. the GOAT. He's, he wasn't a finisher. He's <laughs> full of shit. Never, he probably wasn't even alive. Coach. In, 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 in one of his early games, he had 26 pancakes, and they were not all on the run. Yeah, this the guy's trying three, to say he won't a finisher. Well, he's fucking crazy. I was with the guy, kid every day for 13 years. Let's block him. Turn him who off. Do you, who do you think, the guy with the beard and long hair, who do you think is the GOAT of offensive line play? All right. Uh-oh. Now, Kevin Mawai, Jim Tim, Kevin Mawai is supposed to be coming on the podcast all right not tonight not tonight no one else is coming this is me and coach mcnally all right it's coming but kevin why kevin why steve saunier knows him Uh oh i love kevin why yeah we're we're, we're so you friends i love him i i i i pushed him hard to to speak at the cool clinic and he made the hall of fame he was a great center he was a great player He's one of the top five centers in football. Who was his offensive line coach with the Jets? Uh, I think it might have been Bill Muir, but I know he yeah. got coached by Howard Mudd. Uh, yes. I remember Bill Muir was with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Yeah, but 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 uh, Kevin Mawai is a great guy and a great player. A great player. Uh, yeah. Truly great player. Steven Gukian uh, says ridiculous. Anthony Munoz was the goat. All right. I totally agree. Jim Tim said okay. Why Kevin would that Mo- guy, why would that guy even bring something up like that to a regarding a great football player? Why is the negative? He must be a flaming liberal. I don't know, coach. Anthony Munoz is the best tackle, the best ever. Yeah, I guess these guys are just trying to get us fired up tonight. Well, he did get me fired up. And yeah, you're not going to come on here. You're Munoz not going to come on here. Fin- Munoz would finish that guy right to the turf. He'll squash he, him with one hand. He would do a headstand on him. The guy with the beard and long hair. I, I can see his picture. He's got a fake name. Something about I, I know more. Is his name, Coach? But he's got a beard and he's got long hair. He don't know bullshit. Yeah, that's a don't come on this show and talk smack about Anthony Munoz. All right, okay. We have a I question here. You, I will tell you who I think the greatest three players are. But times are changing because because guys are bigger, stronger, faster, whatever. Greatest tackle, Anthony Munoz. Greatest guard by far, John Hanna. Greatest center by far, Dwight Stevenson. Man, who was it that told me that they went around? Oh, it was Rick Trickett said that he went around and just followed. Uh, that was, I think that was the the Steelers center. Because Dwight Stevenson, he didn't play for the Steelers. Who was the, who was the one? Was it Kurt, was it Mike Curtis? Uh, well, I mean, back in the day, 
it was the kid from Wisconsin that had the uh, brain, uh, you know, he actually died in his car. Uh, I, I know him just like that. His name slips me. Mike uh, Curtis? Mike, no, not Mike Curtis. He played linebacker for the Colts. Mike Webster. Mike, Mike Webster. Mike Webster was a tough, strong. He, well, he was only 250 pounds, but he was wow. outstanding. He was outstanding. He was tough. He was strong. So he was like basically like a power lifter. And he was not fat. He was just rock. He was a rock. And he, he was, was a tough. rock. Mike Webster. To Wyatt Bode, our friend in Minnesota, said it's a Chinese instigator, that guy. he might That guy might have been the guy that had the balloon. Wasn't there a balloon over top of Minnesota? I think it was Minnesota. I don't know my states. They didn't make me learn my states. Okay, here's a question, Coach. A question from Coach Moore. Who is the greatest running back of all time? Gail Sayers. Woo. Woo. My dad used to say the same thing. And Brian Piccolo. Brian Piccolo was from St. Thomas Aquinas. No, no, no. no. I'll happen to say this, that when I watch Jim Brown on TV, he made three or four long runs for touchdowns every game. So it depends on the time thing. I mean, Jim Brown, Gail Sayers, Walter Payton. Uh, really, probably probably the greatest pure running back, Barry Sanders. Well, Coach Moore, Coach Moore here says Emmett Smith. No. He didn't have the speed that Barry – he didn't have the juke ability that Barry Sanders had. But he was a great runner. He made a lot of yards. He had a good offensive line in front of him. But Barry Sanders could make anybody miss. Coach Moore said that Emmett Smith won three Super Bowls and Barry Sanders never won a playoff game. That, that's not true because I know the yeah, Barry, but, but, I know but, that the Lions did. But Emmett Smith had a better offensive line. Yeah. Okay, and a better quarterback and better receivers. Okay. It, Barry Ray Sanders Dayton. did not have a good offensive line. They didn't have a good defense. Barry Sanders. And never had was, a quarterback. Barry Sanders was the whole team. He was the you whole ask team. Anybody that tried to tackle any of those guys, and they say they couldn't even tackle him one on one. Oh, it's, we're getting, there's a lot of comments coming here. Ray Dayton wants to know who's the greatest player from Section 6. Probably me. I don't even know where Section 6 is. I know That's Section Buffalo. 8. That's, That's Buffalo. Buffalo. Coach, how does know, it – There was a guy named uh, Joe Ehrman that played at Riverside. There was a guy named Rick Casada that played quarterback at, from Syracuse. Uh that's our local team here, a local Western New York. Steve Saunier, Mike Webster on run plays would bring his backside elbow to his belly button and use that backside arm for great leverage like Coach McNally talks about clogging for leverage. Matt Davis, Barry Sanders, 100%. Emmett Smith couldn't hold Jerry Barry's jock. No question about it. Barry Sanders Great. was inhuman. In fact, Barry, you interviewed Boudreaux, who was his line coach. Yes. Bear, Paul would say, hey, they've got eight guys in the box, and we only got seven blockers. And Barry would tell him, don't worry, leave that extra guy for me. Yeah. You take care of the front. I got, I got the backer. Greatest fullback. That's what Jim Tim is saying. It, Greatest fullback. He's saying Charles Way and Lorenzo O'Neal. I mean, Franco Harris was a fullback. I think he might be talking about who a was blocker. a blocker as a fullback. I like that big guy that y'all had in the Panthers, Coach. The one that I asked you about, who was the great. He was good. Howard Griffith was his name. He was yeah. outstanding, but. Daryl Johnston was a good blocker for the Cowboys. 
Yes, Rathman. I like that Mike Sellers. He was huge. I don't think he lasted. He never even played college ball. He went to JUCO right to the CFL. You I remember maybe, Mike maybe, Sellers. If you if you really said who was the biggest, strongest guy, the Cleveland Browns had a fullback. All right. Now he was also a runner. But he blocked for Jimmy Brown. His name was Marion Motley. Yeah. And he was he was a bad chicken. Matt Davis said the Lions won a playoff game with Barry. He went to the, the championship game, NFC, one year, and they got beat by the Redskins. Joe Gibbs. Coach, you always tell me it's all about the quarterback. Joe Gibbs, three Super Bowls, three different quarterbacks. Is Joe Gibbs underrated? when it comes to pro football head coaches? No, because I think he's right up there at the top. I think the only buddy that's underrating him is maybe the gentleman that's answering the question. But but out there in the the, the world of football, we think Joe, Joe Gibbs is no question in the top four or five. Yeah. You know what's all bullshit? What? How many Super Bowls you win. That's all bullshit. Because you might have a great defense, you might have a great quarterback, you might now you might be the coach, but the team that's got the best players, Bill Walsh may be known as the best coach. He won as many Super Bowls, right? Almost as anyone. I don't know how many exactly. Uh, there have been some. Sean Payton may be the best present day football coach. He yeah. won one Super Bowl. You, okay. you, when I first met you, I asked you who was the smartest football coach you ever worked with, and you told me Sean Payton. Absolutely. T when did you first meet Sean Payton, Coach? And tell us about Sean Payton, how sharp he is. I met Sean Payton because when I went to the New York Giants in 1999, we were looking for a quarterback coach, and – Sean was like the assistant quarterback coach or some maybe he was the quarterback coach at the Eagles. And um, I don't know if they got fired at the Eagles or he was coming in for uh, an upgraded job. You know, he may have been like an assistant to the assistant. And we hired him as the quarterback coach. And um uh, our second year, we went to the Super Bowl. Now, we got killed by Baltimore, but then he went on to the Cowboys and became a good coach for the Cowboys. And then he went on to be the head coach for the Saints, and they were one of the best teams. What well, They only went to the Super Bowl once, but they were always up there. Uh, they were always know, in the playoffs. You know, but, but, but he did have a good quarterback, too. But he was a good coach. Smart, very Steve, smart. How long did it take you to figure out that that kid was smart when Sean Payton was so young? About 20 minutes. Man, coach is right on. You cannot use Super Bowl wins as a metric for all-time greats. Well, like you take advantage, like, for example, me. I've been to four Super Bowls, lost them all. No, I don't processed to be the greatest line coach ever. But my point is the line coaches that were Super Bowl winners always are listed at the top. Alex Gibbs won two or three Super Bowls. Joe Bugle won two or three Super Bowls. Jim Hannafin won two or three Super Bowls. I'm trying to think of some of the other guys. Uh, Raleigh Dante. Dante Scarnecchia. Yo, Dante Scarnecchia. Well, so they are the GOATs of O-line because of Super Bowls. Dan Marino, everybody thinks he's a great quarterback. He may be one of the best of them all. He might he be. Didn't win, a, didn't win a Super Bowl, okay? I think yeah. a legitimate quarterback that won Super Bowls, whether they won them or not, I think the best quarterback of all time, and I can't say Tom Brady is not, the greatest because he certainly 
when he's on your team, you win. But <laughs> down deep, if you really measured, you get two guys in a room and, 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 and they're both competing in drills for a month. And we just have a quarterback competition and whatever. And uh, we watch him in meeting and we watch this, that, and the other. You know, who I think might be the greatest quarterback. Who? Joe Montana. I, I was thinking you were going to say Peyton Manning because okay. Peyton Manning's just ate up with football, but Joe Montana. Because he could move, he wasn't that tall, but he was very accurate. And they Very won. Accurate. They won as many or more Super Bowls than anybody. Tom Brady played longer, so obviously I'd be probably one, one or two more. Yeah. Joe Montana may be the best quarterback of all time. <clears throat> he was a great one. Uh, you know, Jim hard, Tim. It's, it's hard to say who's the best. Yeah. It's, it's bullshit to say. Really, who is the best? Even with Anthony Munoz, he's rated as the best tackle. I coached him. But then there were a, a lot of other great offensive linemen that were tackles. Yeah. And, you know, uh, Tony Baselli was a great tackle. But he only played four or five years. He got hurt. Uh, the big Jonathan Ogden was a great offensive lineman for the Baltimore Ravens. Okay. Uh, Jim, go ahead. Jim Tim says Steve Walsh or Mike Holmgren. He means Bill Walsh. Bill Walsh or Mike Holmgren. I mean, I think that's pretty obvious. Coach told me Bill Walsh is the smartest guy he'd ever been around, but he actually never coached with him on the same staff. But you knew him from the Bengals, right, Coach? I mean, Bill Walsh. I oh, mean, he taught I, Mike I, Holmgren. I, I knew him because he was at the 49ers when we played him in the Super Bowl. So, I I just knew him. Steve Gukian says, I "Coach, I don't think it's fair to to say who's the best." Yeah, Mike I Holmgren, think people just want your opinion, Coach. They just want to hear your opinion. A tie, you know. I'm going to give Steve, him a tie. Steve Gukian, Coach is right on. You cannot use Super Bowl wins as a metric of all time greats. Now, Jim Tim asks, Jim Fossil or Tom Coughlin? I guess he's a Giants fan. Now, Jim Fossil, coach, worked for Jim Fossil. Tom Coughlin's got two Super Bowls. Well, the the world will say Tom Coughlin was a better coach because he had two Super Bowls. But then Tom Coughlin got fired, I think, at the Giants eventually and at Jacksonville. And then he got fired at Jacksonville as the general manager. Uh, Jim Fossil was only in one Super Bowl as the head coach. So, uh those are those are yeah. questions that when you're drunk you you ask about <laughs> yeah they're they're not even worth who's the best about. bruising they're, back who's the best errors different players different strengths you, different weaknesses of your team uh Jeremy Spear who was my freshman coach his son is our center not the one that was snapping on the side street, Coach. This guy's – he's legit. He's got a 4.0. Who was the best bruising back that you can think of? The best what? Bruising back. Uh, John Riggins was a pretty good bruising back. Yeah. Joe Montana was 4-0 in Super Bowls. Jim Tim says Bruce, Bruce Matthews was a great offensive lineman. DJ Moe says and, and John so, Hanna. And so was the uh, the guard for the Houston Oilers, who was the head coach for the Titans. Uh, I know Malarkey. Was, no, no, no. Malarkey was a tight end. This, this is uh, uh, he was the line coach with the Steelers for a bunch of years. He, I think, he's retired now, but he's in the Hall of Fame. Uh, he went to Penn State. He was a great offense. Offen Munch check. What's that? Munch, Munchak, Munch. Munch. Yeah, Mike Munchak was a good player. A uh, 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 bruising back. Uh, you had uh, one. Listen, listen. I'm going to tell you that 
the entire podcast is going to have to agree with me. It's got to be Jerome Bettis. Oh, man. Without, Earl Campbell. Without, Earl Campbell. Well, no, yeah, correct. Earl Campbell, Jerome, Jerome Bettis. Bettis. Earl Campbell was probably even a little faster. Earl Campbell was a little bit faster. Man, we got a bunch of people in here. They're fired up about this, Coach. They're fired up. Oh, Jeremy Spear. See, Coach, Jeremy Spear went to Fork Union Military Academy. All right. Yeah. And he's saying Eddie George, because Eddie George is a Heisman Trophy winner, and he went to Fork Union with Jeremy Spear. And from what I hear, Eddie George is a great guy. He's the head coach. Where is it at? Tennessee State? Now, so Jeremy Spear loves Eddie George. Did oh, you ever I, coach? I, I think Eddie George was a terrific player. For, he came from Ohio State, but he's nowhere near Jerome Bettis or Earl Campbell. Earl Campbell was a bad, bad man. Uh, now, now, Coach Brown. Know, you, you can't even put people in the number one category. If you put people in the top category, you have to at least at least 10 or 15 people as the number one people. You yeah. can't say anybody is a, you can say Tom Brady may be the goat because he's had the most Super Bowls and he played till he's 44 years old. Yeah. Jim Tim Bettis got put on his blank from Ray Lewis. Ray Lewis was not very physical, was he, coach? He's more of a finesse player. Who is the most physical linebacker? I mean, we had, uh, Bob Sanders, he coached Zach Thomas and Junior Seau with the Miami Dolphins. That's two pretty good linebackers. I'll tell who you is, who was the most physical linebacker I've ever seen, and nobody would even know the name, but I was a coach on the team with the Bengals, and we had a middle linebacker that was the toughest guy I've ever been around. Okay, and his name was Jim LeClaire. And Jim he was from like North Dakota State. So somebody Google him, and I don't know how many years he played, but you talk about a tough middle line. Like Dick Butkus, obviously. You're going to, I mean, Dick Butkus would get the number one vote as the best inside linebacker. I mean, there's no question. Uh, but but what I'm saying is this guy, Jim LeClaire, was so tough. I mean, he was like, Jim Tim knows him. Jim he Tim like, says he, he, he's deceased, but he he uh, he died of Alzheimer's. But he 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 was a glass eater. Oh, a glass eater. Vontez Perfect. Wyatt Bode. Do you know who that is, Coach? Vontez Perfect was a tough, mean, but he was dirty. That's what he, he said. Was, Wyatt uh, Bode said the same thing as you. Dirty. I mean, he was he was not, I mean, he, he, he was overboard. Uh, he was tough now, and, and he was strong. But, I mean, he, he wouldn't fit the entire uh, category of what, a true football player is he would he would fit the toughness aspect and and this that and the other but he was a little overboard okay so you guys are putting names up here and i'm gonna say the name and coach can say whatever he wants about the person whether he knows them whether he doesn't did he coach against them marshawn lynch coach uh, I, you I, told I, I, me marshawn you had him over your house coach talk about marshawn lynch we had him at Buffalo. We drafted him, and there's no question he was probably in in uh, recent times the hardest running, pure running back, not a fullback. Uh, I, I I can't say he was as big and as strong as Bettis, but he he would fit in the same category as Earl Campbell, Jerome Bettis, Marshawn Lynch, but Lynch wasn't as big as those other guys, but he was a strong runner and he had good speed. Yeah. All right. Steve Sarnier says Dick Buckus. 
Jeremy Spears says Jack Youngblood. Do you remember Jack Youngblood? Yeah, Were you Jack coaching Youngblood pro football? was a he. He was either an outside linebacker or defensive end for the Rams. But I don't. He was good, but I don't remember how good. You know, I I, I can't remember. He's a Hall of Famer, I believe. Oh yeah, yeah. Wyatt Bode says that Vontez Perfect is the most fine player of all time. But does Wyatt Bode, who has the latest late hit of all time? Who has the latest late hit of all time, Coach? You do. Yes, I do. And, Coach, I extended my hips on that one, didn't I? Yes, but Vontez Perfect was a dirty player. <laughs> He's, that was kind of dirty, that hit I had, Coach. I mean, I jumped in his ear hole. Uh, yeah, but we're not talking. Yeah. You didn't play NFL football. No, nowhere near it, Coach. I came spell NFL. DJ Mo, Jack Lambert, Coach. He's from uh, Kent State, isn't he? Yeah, and he yeah he was he was an outstanding linebacker. But you like I say, you, you, everybody's naming different guys. You can't. Yeah, there's there's top guys. But they're they're just good? they're getting you to comment on them, Coach. I Did mean, you fun. know him? I knew Jack Lambert. We had to play him when I was at the Bengals. I was at the Bengals 15 years. There was probably eight to nine years that I had to play him every game twice a year. Man. He was tall and lean, but he could run and make tackles, and he was tough. But he wasn't a big, thick, wide-bodied kind of guy. Brian Uh, Erlacher, did you coach against him, Coach? Yes, he was good. He could run. I mean, he could. He really could run. Yeah, the Bears ran that pirate defense when everybody was slanting, and he knew how to scrape off and fill the game. You know, that, that was a perfect defense for him. You know how that the linebackers got to be in their gaps and all that. And uh, so they freed him up a lot with all their pirate stunts that they call. Jeremy Spear brings up. Clyde Christensen's roommate at North Carolina, Lawrence Taylor. Oh, probably the – now, if you said somebody would say, who's the greatest outside linebacker of all time, it would be Lawrence Taylor. No he, question. I mean, I, I – so I'd put him where I said you ought to put eight or ten guys together. I'd put him right up number one. There's Jim Timms went and done the research, and he's got the Jim, the Jim LeClaire, American football player for 12 seasons, 72 to 83, coach. There was a lot of collisions. Yeah, I mean, he, I believe he died of CTE, you know, the, the, the head, because his nose was so. It was gone. And he was so tough. I mean, he was the toughest human being I've ever I've ever seen. And I'll tell you, the other <laughs> toughest human being, maybe the toughest human being ever, ever, toughest, maybe not the best, but the toughest, Tim Crumry. Tim Crumry. Do we know anybody out there that knows Tim Crumry? Who is Tim Crumry, Coach? Tim Crumry went to Wisconsin, was a wrestler in high school, was about an eighth round, eighth or tenth round draft choice coming out of Wisconsin. And he played, oh shit, I don't know, maybe 10 years for the Bengals. He broke his leg in our second Super Bowl versus uh, uh, San Francisco. But you talk about, there's no one tougher. Jeremy Spear says, what defensive coach gave you the biggest headaches? Who was it that you did not like to get ready for? Was there any coach that you you knew you had to be on your A game, Coach? I'll tell you who was a good coach back in the day when he was at the Vikings was a guy named Floyd Peters. And they ran that defense where the every, you know, the three technique and the seven would slant and the nose would come around and they'd be a lot of pinching. Plus they had good players. With John Randall? John Randall. They would had the tilt nose. They had Dolman, Randall. They had a lot of good players. They had a, a big, uh, uh, a big white defensive tackle that was an outstanding player. Millard, Millard, absolutely. They were fucking good. Steve Gukian, Crumry was a nose guard for the Bengals. Derek Thomas, 
He was an athlete, wasn't he, Coach? He I was, mean, but he he died before I played against him too many times. I mean, I might have played against him. About, he was maybe like a little bit of an undersized Lawrence Taylor. Not as yeah. quite as powerful, but had the same kind of speed as Von Miller. Yeah, he was he was a go getter, man. He'd go get the quarterback. My head coach played for Floyd F. Who is that coach? Ray Dayton. Ray, I know Ray. Ray's at um Lackawanna. So co- coach at Lackawanna played for Steve. Says Tim Crumrod was a beast. Coach, how did it feel? And to be able to coach against your college coach, Buddy Ryan. And how did Buddy Ryan feel? Did he ever tell you, like, you making it to the NFL to coach? How did that make him feel? What did it feel like for you to coach against your old college coach that was such an animal? Well, we would talk before the game. We would talk after the game. I think one time he told me, he says, I didn't think you'd be this good of a coach because he only (laughs) knew me as a player. Uh, But uh, we got along. I mean, he knew, he knew who I was. And a lot of times he would pretend when he was in the NFL that he didn't know any of the offensive guys, but but he was my, he, when I was at Buffalo, we played both ways. So he was my defensive coach. So he knew me. And uh, he uh, he liked me, and uh, we were pretty close, to be honest with you. Uh, yeah, he, he was he was a great coach, the great defense. Okay, you got Steve Saunier is bringing up a name, Joe Klecko, and I love Joe Klecko. Oh, when he Joe for the Klecko, Jets. Joe Klecko, Temple. He was only six one, but he was so strong. He got under. I think Munoz one time because he was short and he was playing defensive end. He played defensive tackle. Defense. He lifted Anthony Munoz, who I still think is the greatest tackle or the, you know, whatever. And he got under his wrist and he lifted him up and he put him right on his back. Wow. Steve Gukian, Floyd Peters was very underrated, very talented Vikings team. I agree. I told you I, I, I hated playing his defense. Wyatt Bode said James LeClaire. There's a LeClaire in Little Falls. I don't know about LeClaire. James Le, uh, uh, LeClaire is deceased. Yeah. J- Jim Tim said thoughts on Greg Lloyd, Kevin Green, and Chad Brown. I mean, I think I they had enough. Levon- I coached on the Panthers when we had Kevin Green. He was a little stiff but he was a powerful bull rushing outside backer. A little better athlete was our other linebacker, Lamar Lathan, who uh, uh, played with the Houston Oilers and was a tremendous athlete uh, and, and strong. When I was with the Panthers, our second year, we went to the, to the championship game. We had a great defense. Kevin Green was at one backer. Lamar Latham was another backer. Sam Mills was Ooh. a little short inside line, but he was terrific. We had a big defensive tackle from the Giants named Mike Fox. We had a great nose guard from the West Denver Virginia. Broncos named Greg Cregan. We had a hell of a defense at the Carolina Panthers. Sam 19, Mills. 1996. Sam Mills. Talk Sam about Mills. him, Coach. What was he like? He, I don't, he was short. You know, he was like maybe 5'9", 220 pounds, but he could sneak around and run and make a lot of tackles. Like London Fletcher. Yeah, like London Fletcher. Did you coach against London Fletcher? I coached with London Fletcher. Yeah, with the Bengals, right, Coach? With the Bills. With the Bills. What, what what was the similar and different about London Fletcher and Sam Mills? Probably just their body style. Probably not a whole lot as far as their play. What was different 
about their play? Nothing. Oh, so they played the same because they were undersized inside backers. Yeah. Uh, Steve Saunier says, Sam Mills and John Strollo went to the same high school in New Jersey. Man. That's Long Branch High School, so that must be it, the one. Is that North Jersey or South Jersey? I think it's North, North Jer- Jersey, but I'm not North sure. North Jersey's where all the rich people live, from what I heard. Long Branch, that's where Frank Glazer was the coach, too. Yeah, Frank Glacier. Man, Frank Glacier proud. Would he be proud of the podcast? Would he be glad that people were still talking about football and that you were still up on Twitter? Would Frank Glacier be on Twitter if there was a Twitter? He would think it's all bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> so just a bunch of guys yucking it up, you know? Yeah, just a bunch of guys talking. Yeah, he 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 had a horse voice. He he, he want to get into the the offense or the defense or the plays. Yeah, yeah. He he would be this about trivia, the real life coaching. This trivia bullshit. He that's not it was not his cup of tea. Yeah, Jeremy Spear wants to know: Did you coach Roman Oban? I did. Jeremy, did he go to Fork Union too? Where'd you coach Roman at, coach? One year with the Giants. He came from Louisville. And uh, he had been there, and then I came, and then and then I think he went as a free agent to another uh, team, which team I don't remember. Yeah, Matt Davis said offensive lineman underrated Lomas Brown. Loved Lomas. Hard. I coached Lomas Brown. He played Tell me about Lomas years. Brown. He played 20 years. <laughs> Is he from Virginia? Is he from Roanoke? I don't know where he's from, but he played with the Detroit Lions, the Arizona Cardinals, the New York Giants, and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And uh, he was a thin guy. He was like tall, maybe 6'6". But he, he he's from Miami. More, he probably didn't weigh more than 255, 60 pounds. But he was a good pass blocker. Yeah, he's from Miami. I'm trying to think who was the who was the offensive lineman for the Buffalo Bills that was from Roanoke that was Brown. He was such a huge guy. I can't remember his name. I'll have to look what it up. Position? He was an offensive lineman. I think he was a tackle. Well, fuck. How the hell do I know if you don't know what the hell position he played? Jim, uh, coach, how good – this is from Steve Gukian. Coach, how good was Dave Remington? Very, very strong. Okay. A power lifter. uh, A little – tight you know a little stiff but had a lot of power uh we ended up trading him to the philadelphia eagles because he basically got beat out by a seventh round or an eighth round draft choice from holy cross who was a little better athlete but not as strong as dave so dave was a very powerful center he was a good kid and uh, he played quite a while. He played with for us for a couple of years and then for the Eagles for three or four years. All right, guys that are asking questions, here's, here's what the questions are going to be for Coach. You guys, like myself, have never met an NFL coach or had access to an NFL coach. So the guys like myself, if you ever wondered something about the NFL – Here's your time to ask Coach. He would know the answer. So I'm going to ask my question first. Coach, what is it like on draft day in the war room? Who's making the decisions? Does it depend on the team? What is occurring, Coach? Generally, the some teams, like when I was with the Bengals, we didn't have a lot of scouts early. And we did the majority of the scouting. Now, 
that's not as good as a team that had a lot of scouts because they might be able to see the player three or four times. But I'd go to 30, 40 schools for 15 years, and they let me put the players in the area that I wanted, put them, put him here, put him there. But generally now, everybody's got a lot of scouts or got enough, and uh, they let the play, they let the coaches go out maybe to seven or eight schools to uh, double check some of the players that the uh, uh, directors of scouting have a question for. But generally, the general manager and the head of scouting, along with the head coach, make the decision. They may ask the assistant coach his opinion, but the decision is not made by the coach, not by the assistant coach. Yeah. I would say the head coach, the general manager, and the owner together make the decision. And probably the owner, when there's a tie, makes the final decision. Jim Tim wants to know, when you were coaching, who had a great first punch? Tunch Ilkin. Yeah, he's the Tunch Punch. God rest. Yeah, he died of uh, ALS. Oh, man, there's been so many, Coach, from ALS. He's 60 say- pounds. ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, you said Alzheimer's, a CTE. Uh, now, C- Coach Bald said his name, Reuben Brown. Reuben, Reuben Brown, Brown was-, was from Pitt. He played guard for the Bills. Uh, he wasn't on the Super Bowl teams. He may have played in one of their Super Bowls. And uh, he he's was the one a, from Roanoke. He was a guard. He played tackle at Pitt. And he, and he was a pretty good player. He's a pretty I did good not player. Coach. All right. DJ Mo. And I don't know who DJ Mo is, but he asked some good questions. He must be smart. Coaching question. What is the number? And I think I already know this because you've already talked about it, but I'm going to see what you say. Coaching question, what is the number one attribute an offensive lineman should possess to get to the NFL? Oh, that's uh, that's an impossible question. What is the number one attribute an offensive lineman should possess to get to the NFL? I was thinking that you – I didn't know all the particulars of the question, but you well, talked you can't, about – you can't, you can't – you, there's more than one. You well, the be, one, well, you can't be stupid. <laughs> hey, but, don't be stupid. But, 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 but you can't be five foot ten. Yeah. I, I thought you were going to talk about finishing, being a prick. Talk about that, coach. Because some coaches can't coach it. Finishing. Is that one of them? I would say I'm going to tell you exactly. Let's say you're big enough. You're strong enough. You will finish. If you're dumb, they're not going to take you. So if everything's equal, they're taking the smarter kid. Do they give them an IQ test? They give them the wonder lick. Yep. And Paul Brown was the first one to do that. Because if you don't know what to do when all this shit's happening. it's Yeah, it's so fast. You can be the toughest mother in the world but if you don't know what's going on long arms are a key you don't want a short arm guy long long arms. that's why we preach playing long, long. steve gukion says how much input does the average nfl head coach take from his o-line coach on game day or is it the coordinator Depends on the coach. Will you comment on the coaches that you worked for and how they how they did things? Well, most of the teams let the offensive coordinator call the plays unless the head coach himself is an offensive genius. Like I think, <laughs> well, I think like with the 49ers, Bill Walsh was the or Sean Payton. Yeah. Sean Payton. 
Sean Payton is the play caller. Now, yes. somebody else is a defensive coach and more of a head coach. They let the offensive coordinator call the plays. So there's not an, there's not an exact science. So how much input does the average NFL head coach take from the offensive line coach on game day? I mean, dude, if things are going wrong, I mean, they're going to want to know why, right, coach? And you better have an answer, right? The offensive line coach has got nothing to do on game day but get his ass chewed out. <laughs> Is that why you're the mushroom well, well, society? I mean, I mean, he might see a weakness and remind the coach, don't forget this play worked. Let's run this one again. But you have to be very careful because everybody's on the headphones. And if you're just talking, hey, coach, run this run. Offensive oh. coordinator's talking. The head coach is talking. You keep your fucking mouth shut. Now, this is what I'm talking about, coach. We're getting down to it right now. This is the, So don't be talking on the headsets because you will get cussed out. You will. You might Unless get they fired. say mouse. Mouse. Might, what happened on get, that? You might get fired. You might get fired. Now, when the defense is on the field and you have a recommendation to the coordinator or maybe to the head coach, you're fine. But once the offense is playing, you shut your mouth. You're on the phone with the assistant line coach upstairs. Anything else that's advice like that, that coaches need to know? Keep your mouth shut on the headsets. You keep your fucking mouth shut. Man, that's a, I've heard numerous people say that. Jim Tim, do players respond better with a player's coach or just a regular one? What, 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 how do you feel about that question, coach? Do players respond better with the player's coach or just a regular one? You don't have to be a player's coach. They will not respond to a coach that throws the player under the bus. But that doesn't mean he has to be the player's best friends. Okay? Like I could say, listen, I don't want to be your friend. I don't want to go drink beer with you. I don't want to fucking meet your wife. If we have a Christmas party, okay, I might have it and invite the whole offensive line. I don't want to be your best buddy. You you might get cut, this, that, the other. <laughs> but I'm not going to throw you under the bus. I'm not going to talk when the reporters told me and so-and-so got sacked five times. Uh, I might say something like, well, you saw the game, didn't you? You make your own opinion, uh, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. As soon as you throw a player under the bus, you've lost them. Now, maybe the player deserves to be thrown under the bus because he's an asshole. So yeah. a lot of these questions, there is not – all I'm going to say about football – it's not an exact science. It's not an exact science. A lot science. of these coaches out there that are listening, they would like an exact answer, and there is none. Yeah. That's wisdom. What offensive coordinator that you worked with do you consider to be the best? Sean Payton. Yeah, you said that, Coach. Jim Tim. Hardest to teach run blocking techniques. Or pass. This is a long – Jim, Tim, you're getting to a very, very long question here. Coach is not like these because this this would probably take him days to answer. Hardest to teach run blocking techniques or pass techniques trying to make the jump. What's the, the hardest? hardest to, the hardest to teach is the player that's most limited. The easiest to teach is the player with the most ability. It's not one particular – play it's not one particular block it's not one particular double team the better the player the more athletic the player the easier it is to coach him on that technique or scheme 
It's a great answer, Coach. It's a true. Steve Gukian said, great insider info from Coach. That's pretty cool. Insider info. Coach Bald says, can we get Coach McNally Totem Pole Podcast merchandise ASAP? Yes, we can get Coach some Totem Pole gear because Totem Pole got 100,000 followers now. Jim Tim says, thank you, Coach. Just asking for the wisdom. Coach, is there anything else that you would like to talk about to these guys tonight? If you have any questions, you better answer them because Coach has had a long week. You want to talk about your week? You want to? <laughs> well, I, I spent all week with a Bengal uh, uh, developmental guy who's six foot eight, Devin Corcoran. You can Google him. He's a pretty damn good player. They like him a lot. And he'll be in his second year. He was on the practice squad. And uh, he came here because he knew I worked with the Bengals and I worked with the players. And then he wanted some off-season work. So I spent all week with him. And uh, I'm tired. I spent a good six hours for three days with him. Three hours in the gym. Three hours uh, with video. And... Uh, uh, we had a couple other people that he could block, but it wasn't full, full speed. But uh, no, I, I can just say this. I know this for a fact, and it, it's nobody's fault. It, it's just the way it is. Okay. The present day younger coach didn't have to go through what I did. I had to learn how to run a mimeograph machine where you got all inky. I had to cut up film and put it on the wall. I had to get in a car and go meet a coach from another team, maybe two hours away, maybe three hours away, and we traded film. There wasn't video on your computer that the league <sighs> just sent to you, you know, whether it's your college league or whatever. Uh, I had to go to spring practices to learn. I had to look at a lot of video to learn. Uh, nowadays, however you want to put it, there's so many coaches that so many of the younger coaches, because they're single, they know somebody, they're related to somebody, they become like a graduate assistant or the assistant to the assistant and they move up and they move up and they become the head coach someday. That <laughs> didn't happen when I grew up. So yeah. the coaches now are spoiled. They pretty much want everything given to them. They didn't really have to bust their ass to learn everything I've learned. I've had to research on my own or go to clinics. Okay, now people do go to clinics. I know that, but they got everything on the internet. They can go on fucking YouTube, Coach Tube, this tube, whatever. And the fuck, they don't have to leave their front front house. They do not know. They do not know how to work. They do not know how to work. I bet you the average high school coach goes home for dinner every night. Okay, now that's not everybody. But the average, <laughs> the average high school coach, they go okay, home for dinner. He, he has, he has, he, he's done. He's home yeah. For dinner, what are we going to eat tonight? He, he shows up the next day. Okay. Maybe. Did you maybe, ever ask that when you were coaching? What are we going to eat for lunch? What are we going to eat for dinner? You didn't care, did you? You ate whenever you ate. Never, that was not, home, never went home for dinner. Couldn't. What, what were school? your hours? What were your hours, Coach, with the Bengals? And then well, what would it be like during the season? Your hours are pretty much when the when your last meeting is done, whether it's the coordinator or the head coach, it might average 10 o'clock, okay? You might stay till 11, okay? You might show up at 5 in the morning, okay? Some coaches – weren't ready to necessarily, the head coach might not be ready to go over the offensive game plan till midnight. <laughs> Joe Gibbs kept his staff till three or four in the morning. Yeah. 
He recorded their dinners on a tape recorder. Well, because, I, all, all, all I know is that by Thursday, when they could go home early, they were so exhausted. You don't have to spend that much time. That's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He yeah, won yeah. three Super Bowls, though. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Joe but Bugle. That was Joe your friend, Bugle, wasn't it? He was the line coach. Yeah, Jim Hannafin, all all the Rennie Simmons. There was a lot of guys. But what I'm saying, Joe, Joe Gibbs overdid it because he met with the offense. He met with the defense. He met with the press. He didn't do anything till later. And the coaches loved him because he was a tremendous guy, religious guy, a, a, a compassionate guy. But he kept his coaches till three in the morning, which was yeah. bullshit. Man. Steve, great insight talking football tonight. Jim Tim, thanks, Coach. Your wisdom is truly legendary. Jeremy Spear, thanks, Coach, for sharing your wisdom. Steve Gukion, amen. Jim Tim, just know he's always praying for us all. Thank you, Jim Tim. We need prayer, all right, especially me. Uh, Steve Saunier, great night of football with Coach McNally tonight. Thank you. So, Coach, you basically, when these guys say that they're grinders, these coaches out here, because they go get on Twitter, Twitter, you know, they did a, they did a clinic from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., and they went 12 hours. They're grinders. I mean, 12 hours, that's a short day for you, ain't it, Coach? Well, they may be grinders. They may be whatever. But what they've got, if they just followed me, whether they agree or not, I've put enough shit out there for a guy that knew nothing about football to just watch all my videos in 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 a week. He can learn something. In a week. He can be as good as coach as he wants to be. That didn't happen with me growing up. I didn't have. I couldn't look at somebody putting. No. I must have put 200 two-minute videos with verbiage on Twitter for free. Because you love it. And people want more. They want more. They want to ask me a fucking question, and I tell them, you figure it out. And why are those people not here tonight? They could ask anything. But only the smart ones are actually here. Well, I'll tell you why. Because we're not talking X's and O's. But is his X's and O's overrated, Coach? Oh, absolutely. (laughs) Well, 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 So is it the Jimmys and Joes, or is it the X's and O's? Well, the game has changed. It's a quarterback league. It's a passing league. College and pro and probably high school too some high schools don't have anybody in the backfield but the quarterback yeah i mean really when you get down to it that's not real football that's trickery and yeah it works yeah if it's if it's raining and it's cold and 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 you you win football but real football real football yeah running the football it's changed not necessarily running there was a tight end, there was a flanker, there was a split end, there was two backs. That was football. And That's before football. that, it was the single wing. There was the wishbone, the veer. DJ Mo. Now, DJ Mo says. Now it's all fucking pass. That's what it is. And do you like that? It's more complicated now because the protections are more complicated because they want six-man protection. They want to get the back out. They don't want backs in there blocking because the back blocks, then somebody blitzes, which makes sense, really. You know, the, the more receivers you have. But it's become a game of, I don't know, basketball. Basketball and grass. Yeah, yeah, it, it it's 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 really not football anymore, and and but that's not bad. Uh, we've taken the head out of the game, which is good. Uh, 
because too many guys are dying of CTE, but, but it, it's, you know, the smartest guys that know the passing game and have a good quarterback are probably going to beat everybody. <laughs> yeah, they're going to beat everybody. The best thing on Twitter, I'm here. That's what DJ Mo says. Jeremy Spears says, just run the dang ball. Matt Davis, one heck of a podcast. Coach Taylor, absolutely love this hearing you guys shoot the crap about football. Amazing info. That's what Coach McNally said. We're just going to bust some chops. All right. <laughs> We're just a bunch of slaps. Slappies, ain't we, Coach? We're just a bunch of slappies, but I don't know where the rest of those Twitter coaches are. They're not here. Coach, I'll tell Don you one Cole. thing that I really believe. Alex Gibbs, who's the leader of the wide zone, he came to me to find out how to run it because we ran it well at Cincinnati. And then he, oh, we have a comment. We have a comment, coach. Well, let me finish. He, yeah. Then he expanded his wide zone. But the wide zone now – is becoming a little extinct that defense has caught up with it because everybody just runs off the ball and all the defensive guys, all they got to do is two gap you and knock your ass back. So I think the traps and the G plays and pulling people now and, and misdirection has become a little bit more in the running game than just the plain fucking zone plays. I mean, yeah. really, when you watch a game, the other thing that I fucking hate, I hate, okay, and high school guys don't do it quite as much as college. The quarterback looks over to the sideline, makes a dummy cadence, blue, 42, 40, over. Everybody looks over, boom, boom. You're on the stands, you're watching a game, cut the shit. Snap the fucking ball, whether you're in the shotgun or under center, and let's play fucking football. Read the coverage. Do what you got to do. All that looking to the sideline bullshit drives me fucking crazy. You don't like it. Coach, I don't, Coach I don't. Old School has returned. Coach Old School says that you did not invent the wide zone. Alex Gibbs did. He did not invent the wide zone. He came to me to figure out how to run the wide zone. He will tell you that in his deathbed. He yeah. will speak at a clinic. Any You get his first clinic, and he'll tell you, I went to Jim McNally to get the wide zone. Coach, uh, coach, either, either I, he's lying, we, either he's lying, or I'm lying. Coach, I thought we, I thought we blocked Coach Old School. How did how did Coach Old School come back here? Coach Old School says he invented the duo. That is not true, Coach. I did. <laughs> so who, who he says he he invented it? Coach Old School. What's his real name? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. How did Why he would get he on? say? How did he get on? I don't know, Coach. This is, this is YouTube. Why would he say that he gave you duo? What I mean, why why would a guy make that up? Well, what's Ray his Day what's his what's his real name? I don't, it just says Coach Old School. Ray Dayton, who do you make responsible for the protection? The center or quarterback? I put it I, in the play call, but what did you do, Coach? I would prefer the quarterback. And why is that? Because then the center doesn't have to think so fucking much. He's yeah. over the ball. He's in a stance. His fucking <laughs> head is down. He's got to think about the silent count. The quarterback is standing up. He can see the whole defense. Matt Davis. That's why I love me some Michigan football. We run the ball down your throat and over top. Beautiful. Well, Matt Davis, I hate to I hate to tell you this, but now we've got Coach uh, Smith here. Uh, says he is from the great state of Ohio. Great uh, Coach Smith says that Ohio State is actually the more physical team, and that Michigan is soft. 
that Michigan is a bunch of prima donnas and Ohio State is the tough working man's school. Coach, I, I, I think that it's Michigan. I don't agree with the Coach Smith. Matt Davis, how do you feel about that? You know, the Ohio State guys on here talking junk. I think that's all bullshit. That's all bullshit. <laughs> the, the team with the toughest kids has got the toughest team. Yeah. If you recruit tougher kids, you're going to have a tougher team. And it hasn't been Ohio State. It's been Michigan. Steven, I you mean, can you, win game. You, you can win a game with guys that aren't tough because they're skilled athletes. You can win games with power, speed, or deception. You have to use what you have. And that's exactly what Coach said. Wyatt, Wyatt Bode from Minnesota. What's your opinion on the Armed Forces Academy's way of playing, Coach? Well, I, 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 I like the way they play because you're not going to find a quarterback to come to the Army, Navy, or Air Force uh, because they play the wishbone and they're not trained in the drop back pass and they have a commitment. But now a good quarterback can immediately go into the NFL. So I think going to the academies is fine as long as they get away from the wishbone. If they don't get away from the wishbone, they're never going to get a quality throwing quarterback. Now, that doesn't mean they're not going to win. Yeah, but how many quality throwing quarterbacks are there? I mean, there's every half of the NFL teams think that their quarterback's terrible. I mean, well, what I, I'm saying is the academies cannot recruit a passing quarterback because they don't pass. Yeah. Now, Jeremy Spear agrees. Michigan, baby, OSU sucks. Now we're not going to get coach started on that, okay? I don't I don't know how you can say that because there's 110,000 people in the stands. Both of their recruiting budgets are 100 million dollars. They can recruit the best players they can get their hands on. They're all good kids. They're all tough kids. And I just think that people think that way because they're a fan of that team. Yeah. If they were just just a regular, like an announcer, okay, they would not have that opinion. Somebody thinks their team is tougher and this, that, and the other because that's their favorite team, or that's the where I want they went to school. Yeah. And 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 they're paranoid and obsessed. It's just like pro football fans. When their team loses, they're in the tank for a week. When the Michigan fans lose, they're in the tank. When yeah. Ohio State fans lose, they're in the tank. Ray Dayton wants to know, how do you teach the silent count? We Well, we teach the silent count with the center using a silent one or a silent two with a head bob. When his head goes down, the tackle perifs it. And as soon as the head comes up, excuse me, as soon as the center puts his head down, his head is going to come up and the ball is going to be snapped. The tackle sees the center's head go down and then immediately he turns and blocks. Matt Davis, have you seen the past two years? Uh, Ohio and I like to refer to it as the armpit of America. It's a bunch of BS. Coach Michigan pounded Ohio State the past two years. They're soft. And they won't win for a while against Michigan. And from what I hear is the Ohio State fans, the alumni are the ones that think that they're better than other people. Now, Woody Hayes, Coach Hayes, we're not going to disrespect him on this podcast. All right. And Bo Schembechler was his assistant. And Jerry Wampler was Era Parsegian's O-line coach. And I think they all are from Miami of Ohio. Coach, is Miami of Ohio the cradle? Of coaches. Absolutely. Woody Hayes, Era Parsegian, Bo Schembechler. Who else? Oh, the Stoopses are from Miami of Ohio. 
the uh, coach from uh, the uh, Eagles. I mean, sorry, coach from the uh, 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 the Ravens. Harbaugh. Weeb Eubank. Weeb Eubank. Jeremy Spear, Woody, and Bo were legends. Yes, they were. And that was a great rivalry. Probably the greatest. Is there a better rivalry than that, Coach? Uh, Army Navy. Weeb Eubank, Paul Brown. Paul Brown. Oh, Miami, Miami of Ohio. Ohio. Steve Gukion says, love the duo play. Oh, now, Coach, this is a good one here. Can no, you explain I'm the difference? going to. Can you explain the difference between duo and inside zone no. in your expert opinion? <laughs> Two-hour clinic. <laughs> He's overstepped his bounds. <laughs> <laughs> well, how did you develop the duo, Coach? Why did you develop it? Because we wanted to play where we would get some double teams and not pull a guard and have all the problems of the center blocking back and the guard, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the guy, the guards pulling for spilling the play. So we just fell into blocking the box rather than a lead back blocking the force. We had the back block, the force, excuse me, the back block, the Sam in the box, then we could double team back to the Will and the Mike. And that's how duo started. Absolutely. There you have it. First time I saw it was when the Patriots did it with Tom Brady. And I thought he was opening up to run inside zone to the right, and they were blocking inside zone to the left. That's what I, I didn't know. I, I, that's what I put it in my mind. I said, he's opening up like it's inside zone to the right, but they're blocking inside zone to the left. I didn't know that Coach McNally had invented the duo play, and Coach Old School did not. In fact, I'll tell you who I invented it with, Mike Pope. Mike yeah. Pope was a great coach for the New York Giants, the Dallas Cowboys, the Washington Redskins. So you can have everybody Google Mike Pope, and he spent most of his career with uh, Bill Parcells. Parcells and Mark and I rec uh, developed it at the Bengals when he was uh, coaching with us in like maybe 92 or 93. Uh, Mark Bavaro and Jeremy Shockey were coached by Mike Pope. Were they not, Coach? Yes, they were. Hmm. And he also coached that good tight end who played for the Cowboys. Jay Novacek? No, the one after him. Oh, Jason Witten. Yes. From Elizabeth in Tennessee. DJ Moe says Michigan and Notre Dame. Steven Gukion, power without a puller. That's one way to say it. Steven Saunier, Era Parsegian, Miami. Of Ohio. Did you know Coach Parsegian, Coach? What was so good about him? He ran the wing T at Notre Dame and had good players, and they were outstanding. And I had a, a great coach, Mike Stock, came on the podcast. Mike Stock. Coached for Era Parsegian, played yeah. for Era Parsegian. Talk and about he, Mike Stock, a great Mike, coach. Mike Stock was a fullback and a kicker from Northwestern who was coached by Era. And then when Era uh, became the coach at Northwestern, he hired Mike Stock maybe as a graduate assistant or something. And then when uh, he coached with Era at Notre Dame and uh, uh, he coached with me at Buffalo when uh, Doc Urich, who was an assistant at Notre Dame, came to Buffalo. And uh, he ended up coaching in the NFL for years as a special teams coach. Jeremy Spear, my freshman coach. Who was the most motivating coach 
you worked with? Who was the best motivator? Probably Forrest Gregg because he scared you. Forrest Gregg played for the most motivating coach of all time, Vince Lombardi. Correct. Coach, uh, Coach Stevens here wants to know, who was your best friend in coaching pro football? Probably Mike Pope. Even Mike Pope was your best friend. I coached friend. With him at the Bengals and the Giants. Mike Pope. I've tried to get a hold of Mike Pope. Haven't been able to get a. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to call him back, Coach. I'm gonna have to call Mike Pope. Did I give uh, you his number? Your, yes, you did, Coach. I just need to call him again. Mike Pope is your yep. best friend in coaching. Yes. All right, Coach. Uh, coach Smith wants to know who are some coaches that you mentored. <laughs> that, yeah, we don't have enough time to answer that, do we? Who are some coaches that you mentored, Coach? I mentored Scott Peters a little bit. I mentored Bill Callahan a little bit. Uh, I mentored... Uh, I'm trying to think of the guys that have moved on. Uh I mean, when you mentor somebody, there's somebody usually that you have worked with and they're an understudy of yours. They're not the people that are the 300 people that are sitting in the crowd at the cool clinic that you <laughs> may have mentored. So uh, that's a hard question because I may have mentored a lot of people that I don't know that I've mentored. Because yeah. they may have followed me through every damn lecture I've ever been to and may say I'm their mentor. Loaded yeah. question. Who, over the last year since you've been out of football, since you got out of the Bengals, what coach calls you the most since you've been out of football? You. Wow. And I've only known you for two months. So other people don't want to bother you. They they probably have other things they're doing, coach. You know, they probably they're probably coaching. They're not calling well, you bother. I, I, I don't think other people know that much about me. I mean, they may know, well, there was a line coach named McNeil, but until I got on the Twitter, I got eight thousand some followers in a month. And I'll bet you 7,000 of those followers have never heard of me. They never heard of you until now. And yeah. now you're back changing the game again, playing long, not pounding the post. Uh, rooting the feet. Rooting the feet, not Arch lead stepping. Arching, arching the back. Uh, arching the back. Yeah, uh, one arm is longer than two. Alternate punches on pass protection. Uh same old shit. I put it all out there. I, I can't stand these fuckers that ask me a question when I've put eight to ten videos out on that particular subject. That's why you have really helped me because you told me to put on my profile that Coach McNally will not answer a question that he's either already covered or he will not evaluate a coach. I mean... I appreciate all these coaches, but some coaches want me to look at their plays. I don't want to do that because no. then I'll have another coach that wants me to do it and another coach and another coach. I'll answer a short question and I will send the video out that I think is important. I can't spend all day on this fucking Twitter bullshit. <laughs> Steve said Coach McNally is mentoring us now. Steve said, Coach McNally is still making a difference in the game of football. So, Coach, I asked Steve this today. I texted him. I said, when was the last time people had heard from Coach McNally before he got on Twitter? 
And he said that the last time people really had heard from you was the last cool clinic. Yes, because I they they always let me start the cool clinic or work the cool clinic because I I started the cool clinic in nineteen eighty two. Wow. You started the cool clinic. I did. Why did you start it? Just because you love football and it's almost like having this podcast. No, it would be- no, no. I was at the Bengals and college coaches used to come to Cincinnati recruiting in the spring. Okay. And we were not coaching football. We may have had a mini camp or two or something. So coaches would ask if they could come and talk football with me. So I would set a date. Okay, you could come April 13th to our offices in Riverfront Stadium. And maybe I had eight or nine coaches. And then the next year, we might have had 20 or 21 coaches. And then the next year, we we increased the size of our building and had a bigger room. And then I might have had 100 coaches. And then finally, the owner says, we can't have this many people. Just Paul Brown. <laughs> Paul Brown said that or Mike Brown? Mike Brown. And so then we went to the hotel, the Clarion Hotel, which is the Stouffer's Hotel, which is the hotel that we had it in. And then it went from 100 to 200 to 300. And then when I went to the Carolina Panthers, okay, in 1995, I didn't know if I could take the clinic with me because I didn't know a hotel in Carolina and this so I gave it to Bob Wiley, who went down to Tampa Bay to coach the Bucks, and that's when he started adding pro coaches only. I had high school coaches, college coaches, different position coaches, and I only charged $10 a person to come <laughs> to the cool clinic. I never paid anybody. I didn't pay anybody's airplane flight, and I had different coaches. If I had 10 coaches speak, maybe six of them were O-line and maybe the other four were maybe a defensive coach, a quarterback coach, and uh, we only charged 10 bucks a person. So that's the history of the cool clinic. Yep. Right there. And an old coach coach will say I didn't invent it, but I did. You invented it. So how do you feel now, Coach, that you have upped your Twitter presence, you have increased your following, and now, next month, you are going to be back center stage at the Cool Clinic. Are are you more aware of the state of football and the football IQ of coaches out there and what they're teaching from being on Twitter. Now you know what to teach, what to say. Or would it have been different, Coach? Has being on Twitter and this experience changed your cool clinic talk? No, no, because the, the, the guys that I'm talking to on Twitter, I don't see them face-to-face. I don't know them. I just send shit out and they retweet or they make a comment and uh, it's, it's all virtual. Everything is virtual. There's no face to face with a coach or you're in a staff meeting or you're whatever. I mean, now coaches themselves may be in their own staff meetings with their own team or coaches, but when they're corresponding with people on Twitter, they're all, by themselves. Ray Dayton, do you ever pass at the back set of duo? The back side of duo. Do you ever pass set the back side of duo? Or is it squeeze hinge no, you like never, regular power? You, you don't squeeze hinge on duo. Duo, everybody's blocking back. So the backside tackle can just block the end man. Ray asked me a million questions on duo, and I don't know if he still gets it. But I love Ray Dayton. But <laughs> he's, he's the offensive coordinator at Lackawanna, coach. 5,000 questions on fucking duo. You can pass. You <laughs> so, can pass. You can pass block 
on the backside of duo, okay? You don't have to squeeze hinge because nobody's pulling. Yeah, he said, I don't get it. I mean, dude, yeah, block back. Yeah, I mean, I think, Ray, that team that you have, it doesn't matter what play you call. All right, y'all are loaded. Like a coach, they, it was illegal what they did to this team at my school, LC Bird High School. I let Lackawanna come down here, or Lackawanna. I hope I don't say it wrong because I know they get very offended when I mispronounce their city's name. All right. Lackawanna, all right, came down here and scored 100 points and a half against a team that looked like the Little Giants. I mean, they were like the bad news bears, coach. It was like Walter Matthau coaching a football and, and, and team. And then he says, I don't get. I don't <laughs> yeah. get. Yeah, that's fair. Coach McNally, is the cool clinic without him? There is none. Yeah, it no, is true. That's not, that's not so because they got so many coaches now that are active. I'm retired. So many coaches now that are active and all the younger coaches care about the all the zone read RPO concepts, this, that, or the other, that the younger coaches are taking the lead. I mean, they put me on because I started it and, and this, that, and the other. But, uh, uh, you know, all of the variables that they're doing in college football. I mean, fuck, I don't know. They got... 10, 12 college coaches speaking. Uh, and, uh, you know, they they have trouble getting pro coaches speaking because they've got all those off-season training programs. Uh, and they, they have trouble getting away to do the cool clinic. That's why it's virtual, really, uh, rather than in person, because many of the coaches in the NFL, uh, you know, can't get away from their – off-season programs. Yeah. Steve says, Ray blocked the backside like the front side of zone. And then Steve says, I know the answer, but tell the people what cool stands for. You coaching, actually did. Coaching organization of offensive line. Coaches of the offensive line. Coaching, coaching or organization. Coaching organization. Of the offensive line. Of the offensive line. The cool clinic. Hey, which was coach. started. Two hours and a half. Two hours and seven fifty. You're done. Minutes. You're We're done. done. You will be back on Twitter tomorrow. I will. will you be? I don't know. It depends on how I feel. Coach, people are waiting for you to tweet. They say they check the Twitter to see if you're tweeting, just like they used to check under the Christmas tree to see if Santa Claus came, Coach. So how yeah. many? How many? How many guys have we actually had watch tonight? The whole time on YouTube, we had 15 people watch. Now we got 10. So you got some very loyal guys. Uh-oh, some guys on here, he's saying F the New York Giants. Well, you know, coach, coach for a lot of different teams. So you can say F the New York Giants, um, Ashante, Ariel. They're not, they're not my favorite team, the New York Giants. I yeah. was 50, I was 25 years with the Bengals. Yeah. Notifications Joe are the on. Best quarterback in football. Yeah, notifications are on. Come from tw came from Twitter. So DJ Mo came from Twitter, and he loves you. Good night, Coach. Go to sleep. Wake up tweeting. They Goodbye. cannot. They cannot wait, Coach. They we check our phones when we wake up to see if you tweeted anything. Yeah, thank you, Coach. He's gone. Everybody have a good night. Coach is out.